For those of you who don't know me, I'll give you a brief introduction about myself. I am a lead web developer and DevOps engineer at Unleash Technologies. And my primary coding language is PHP. Uh, I do a lot in PHP. I've been doing it for uh, many years now. Um, you might know me from the PHP League, uh, from my Common Mark library, um, or from my PHP 7 um, upgrade guide ebook. But I don't do just PHP, although that is my um, primary language. Um, I also have experience with JavaScript, Java, C Sharp, Python, and a few other languages. Now, this talk today is about debugging, and the concept of debugging and um, the topics I'll cover apply equally to every language. Um, but because we're here at DrupalCon, and Drupal is powered by PHP, and PHP is my personal favorite language, um, you'll see a lot of these examples here will be in PHP. But you can take these with you as you go and learn new languages. So a quick overview of where we're going today. Um, we're we're going to start off by talking about the importance of debugging. Why are we spending an hour of our time today talking about this? Why is debugging an important skill to have? From there, I'll break down a five-step debugging process that I use and that I find to be really helpful, and hopefully that can be helpful for you as well. I'll also share some different tools and techniques I use when debugging certain kinds of situations. And then if we have time, I'll open it up for any questions you may have. So let's talk about debugging. If you had to describe the word debugging, or if you had to describe the process of debugging using one word, what's a word that might come to mind? You might say debugging is annoying, debugging is frustrating, debugging is time consuming, it's hell, it's Genius. tedious. Yep, all great answers. Um, me, personally, I enjoy debugging. I enjoy puzzles, so I might say debugging is fun. Um, it can be fun. Um, but more than that, I think that debugging is important. In fact, I'd argue that debugging is the single most important skill in programming. Now, that is a very bold statement. Let me try and back that up with some data. Uh, let's say we wanted to break down the amount of time we spend during a typical day. Where do we spend that time? We might say, well, we spend two-thirds of our time coding, adding that new feature, and maybe a third of our time planning, updating task lists, um, going to meetings, things like that, checking email. But do we really spend two-thirds of our time coding and adding in these brand new features? According to the Mythical Man Month, the answer is no. We actually spend up to half of our time testing and debugging our code, figuring out why that code didn't run, adding tests to make sure that the code works as it's supposed to. So if we're spending up to half of our time on a daily basis testing and debugging, then debugging is a skill that it's really important to become proficient at. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. Now whenever I give a talk, I like to put a definition um, to what I'm talking about. So I stole this right off of Wikipedia. It says that debugging is the process of finding and resolving bugs or defects that prevent correct operation of computer software or a system. And you'll notice I highlighted the word process because debugging really is a process. It's not something that you should do haphazardly. It's not something you should actually accidentally stumble into. It's a process. Um, process really is the foundation of effective debugging. You need to have a solid process in place when you're presented with a problem to know, okay, I have this problem. What do I do next? What's my next step? How do I go from problem to solution? So we want to have this solid process in place. And once we have that, we're going to use that every time we're faced with some issue. The more and more we go through that process, the more and more experience we'll gain. We'll gain experience as developers with the languages and frameworks that we're using. We'll gain experience with our IDE and debugging tools and gain experience with the code base we're working in as well. So the more and more we debug issues and the more we go through that process and the more experience we build up, we're eventually going to develop our intuition, this ability to kind of instantly know what kind of issue you're dealing with when it's presented to you. You might come across an error like connection timed out. And the first time you see connection timed out, it's kind of scary, you don't know what it's about. But by the time you've solved 10 connection timeout issues, you'll know, oh, that's a networking problem. There might be a firewall up, some port is not open, maybe MySQL isn't running. And that's that kind of intuition you want to develop, that ability to immediately know, OK, I see this type of issue. I know where I need to look. I know what kind of tests I need to run to get this resolved. 
So in order to develop that intuition, all you need to do is just focus on the process. And that experience and that intuition will come with time. So let's talk a little bit about that debugging process. I'd actually like to start by talking about um, the process that a more junior developer would go through when they're faced with an issue. Um, so someone who's kind of new to programming, doesn't have a lot of experience, what are they going to do when they're faced with some issue that they need to debug? Well, chances are they're going to try the usual steps. They're going to clear caches, do a composer install, chmod everything to 777. <laughs> and this may fix their issue. Um, these are valid solutions sometimes. Well, maybe not the last one, but the other two can be valid solutions sometimes. And so they're going to try those. And maybe they'll work, maybe they don't. If they do work, the junior developer will say, OK, great, I solved the problem, and then move on with their day. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying these. But if you are a junior developer and you're trying those usual steps, take a moment, once you find that it works, to ask yourself, why did that work? Why did I need to clear the cache for that bug to go away? Why did I need to run Composer install? Why did I need to check the permissions of the file? So take a moment, think through why that worked. Don't just run the usual steps because they're usual steps. Really think through it and understand why that worked. Something else a junior developer will typically do is to ask someone else. Maybe they'll ask a coworker, maybe they'll ask um, Google or Stack Overflow, and they'll get an answer. Again, that's awesome. You should definitely do that. But if you do that, don't just apply that solution and move on with your day. Think about, why did that particular answer solve my problem? Why that one and not this other thing that I found or this other approach that I tried? Why was this one the one that solved my issue? Something else that I think junior developers um, tend to fall prey to is what's called the XY problem. They're faced with problem X, and they think to themselves, OK, how do I solve X? And they'll try and solve it, try and solve it, and they're just not really getting anywhere. So what they'll do instead is they'll say, OK, well, solution Y might work. And they'll go on Stack Overflow and ask, how do I do Y? The problem um, with this XY problem is if you fall prey to this, you are giving up on finding that proper solution. You're looking for a workaround instead of trying to find what is the actual solution to my current problem. Um, so you really want to try and focus on solving problem X. Even if it's difficult, just be persistent. Um, as you'll see um, later in my slides, I, persistence really is key to developing your experience. Even if it is difficult, try and stick it out and try and solve problem X without resorting to a workaround. Because a workaround or an incorrect solution can cause problems later. And I'd like to actually share a personal story of when I was a junior developer and I fell prey to the XY problem. So many years ago, I got my first big Magento project. Uh, Magento is an open source um, e-commerce solution built on PHP. It's something like 2 million lines of code and XML, mostly XML, unfortunately. Um, it, it's a beast to work with, um, very high learning curve. And for me as a junior developer, um, it was very challenging for me starting off trying to do some complex things. And the first client I had um, was a um, local restaurant that ships seafood overnight. You can go on their website, you can order crab cakes. Um, they're from Maryland, so of course they have crab cakes. And you can get those shipped overnight on ice packs right to your door, which is kind of awesome. Um, awesome concept. We get to build this custom thing um, in Magento. So one of the things that they needed was the ability to print out um, FedEx shipping labels directly from the website. So the customer pays for the order. They can go on the back end, click a button, generate a PDF with the shipping label that they slap on the box and send it on its way. Now, Magento didn't come with that functionality back then. I think it might now. But it didn't back then, so I needed to implement that. And I figured it out. It was awesome. Um, my first big integration, and it worked. And it continued working for many, many years. Fast forward a few years, um, we had the second problem with this website. Um, this website uh, was originally designed for IE8. Um, so all the JavaScript that Magento had and all the JavaScript we wrote was for IE8, but they upgraded to IE9. And IE9 just was breaking the entire backend. So I thought to myself, OK, I have this problem, problem x. I need to make this work in IE9. How do I do this? It was kind of challenging. I didn't really know. 
Um, I found this solution online. Maybe I can add this um, meta tag to the page and make the browser behave like IE8. Um, and this is kind of a valid solution. However, I didn't know how to add this to every page in the admin area. I didn't realize you know, there's this base template I can pop it into or there's this really good way of doing things. So I said, okay, if I need to get this on every page, maybe I can hook into this event that fires at the end of the request. What I'll do is I'll use a regular expression. I'll look for the head tag on the page, and then I'll just do a little find and replace and just pop this in right before the closing head tag. So this is definitely a workaround, um, not the proper solution, but it worked. It solved my problem. Um, I was able to get the site working in IE8. This was inserted on the page. Awesome until a few months later when those um, shipping label PDFs stopped working. Out of nowhere, they suddenly became corrupted. We hadn't touched the code in a couple weeks and just broke, so that was really confusing. Um, FedEx Web Services was working fine. Everything looked fine. Nothing changed. Why is it broken? Well, I tried opening the PDF on my computer and it said file corrupted. So I said, okay, if the file's corrupted, let me actually open it up in like Notepad or Vim and look at the actual bytes and see if anything in there looks funny. When I did that, I saw a bunch of base 85 encoded content. Then I saw this in the middle here. Um, now, I was wondering, OK, how did this HTML get into a PDF? That doesn't make any sense. How, how did this code impact this? Well, it turns out that base 85 encoding can contain the characters less than sign H-E-A-D. Um, so it, the regular expression matched on that. It saw the um, closing um, greater than sign there and decided to insert that into my PDF. Um, so yeah, long story short, don't parse HTML with regular expressions. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have a bad time. But more importantly, solve problems the right way. Because even if you do find this nice little hack or this nice little workaround or this other way of doing things, it can cause these types of problems later. So just make it easy on yourself. Try and find that proper solution. Now, there are some other things that I think um, we have developers can sometimes fall into. Um, this, we can sometimes fall into this form of magical thinking. When we see an issue and we say to ourselves, I don't know why this is happening. Or for some reason, this broke. Um, this behavior doesn't make any sense to me. And if you find yourself asking yourself these questions, um, realize that computers are logical machines. Um, they're not magical black boxes that do their own thing and have their own minds. Um, computers are logical. Um, the code we run on them is logical. Computers only know two things, zero, one, on, off, true, false, yes, no. There's no maybe bit. There's no sometimes bit. Um, the code is logical. And if a bug is simply a defect in our code, then a bug must also be logical. And if a bug is logical, it has a logical explanation that you can find if you're persistent. Now, I really like this quote from Nick Parlanti in Debugging Zen. He says, the bug is not moving around in your code trying to trick or evade you. It is just sitting in one place doing the wrong thing in the same way every time. When you're trying to debug a problem and you're looking in this one um, source code file, the bug isn't you know, jumping out of that file into a new file. Um, and then you go look over there and it jumps back. It's not doing that. Um, again, a bug is a defect in code. The code is right there. The code is logical. There is a logical explanation for it. You just need to be persistent enough to find it um, and to identify what is the um, logical steps that it takes to replicate this issue. Now, when I'm faced with an issue, the very first thing that I assume is that my code is the problem. Um, I almost never assume that my code is perfect and it's someone else's bug. The reason being that 95% um, you know, of the code I write is my code. Um, if I'm using a project like Drupal, there are thousands, tens of thousands of contributors using that project, testing that out. The chance that my website is broken because of a core Drupal bug is extremely low. More likely than not, I put a bug in my code and I didn't know about it. Um, so if, you know, let's say 95% of the time that bug is my fault, why would I want to spend my time um, looking at the Drupal core to figure out why my site's not working? I should look at my code first because that's where the highest probability of that bug being is. 
Um, and if you're helping others to debug a problem in their code, I think you should also assume that um, their code is the problem. Um, now, you don't have to be, you know, kind of snarky about it. Be like, ha ha, you suck at coding. Um, but again, just game of percentages. Um, if there's a bug um, that just popped up and they're working on the code, chances are they might have introduced it. Um, so if you are helping um, someone else with a problem, take what they tell you with a grain of salt. Try and challenge any assumptions um, that they have made. Um, the only assumption that you should be making is that your code is the problem. Don't assume that your code is perfect. Don't assume that you've covered every edge case unless you have actually looked at the code and verified that it is indeed doing what you thought it would be doing. So that kind of covers um, some of the philosophy of debugging, um, some of the things you should watch out for, um, some of the um, assumptions you should and should not make. What I'd like to do next is to actually share a five-step process that I use um, to debug. Um, and this is a five-step process that I, I didn't really realize I was doing it until I sat down one day and realized I have this logical process for debugging these logical issues. Um, and it kind of breaks down like this. Um, there are these kind of five steps um, that I go through. And I'll go through these in a little more detail in the next slides. Um, but first, I start off by gathering information about the issue. Figure out what's going on, what am I seeing, what is the behavior. After that, I try and replicate the issue with 100% certainty. So figure out what steps do I need to take to make the issue come up. Once I've done that, I'll go in and actually identify the culprit, fix it, retest, and then prevent it from happening again. So let's talk about these in a little more detail. The first step is to gather information. And the most important thing you can do is to identify what is the expected behavior of your application versus the actual behavior. So I expect that um, when I download PDF, the PDF is valid. The actual behavior is that the PDF is corrupted, for example. Other good pieces of information you'll want to gather, um, any error messages that you have, Error messages are my best friend. I think the nicest thing about error messages is that they're not randomly generated. Anytime that you see an exception that has been thrown or an error that has occurred, there's a good chance you can Google it and find a solution. You can search the code base and see where that exception was thrown from. Um, that, that can help you lead, back, lead you back to the source of that issue. Even more helpful than error messages are stack traces. A stack trace will tell you exactly what line of code caused the issue. And it'll tell you what line of code called that, what line of code called that, all the way back up to the top. So you can kind of visualize how your code got to that point in time where it failed. You can kind of reverse engineer what might have happened um, to get you there. Now, if you're dealing with a bug on a website and it's on the front end, um, it would be very helpful to grab a screenshot, um, as well as um, note the browser and operating system that might be used in case it is a front end JavaScript bug. Now, I work for an agency. Um, we develop um, sites and applications for other businesses. And sometimes um, our clients aren't the most tech savvy, but all of them know how to take a screenshot. Now, you might get that faxed to you. You might get it pasted in a Word document. Um, but you're still going to get that screenshot. And screenshots are really nice, because they're going to show you what URL you're on, what was inputted into the form, what was going on at the time, who they were, log who they were logged in as. Um, if they take a screenshot of their full desktop, you can see the time and the date. You can use that to cross-reference with your logs to see what's going on. So screenshots are really powerful tools. Um, and if you don't get the date and time in that screenshot, um, maybe you're going through the site and you encounter the issue, just jot down the date and time. Because again, you can go and cross-reference the server logs, watchdog logs, um, and kind of see what was happening at that time. Were there any interesting errors or exceptions or unexpected events happening? Basically, we want to define the symptoms of this problem and collect as much data as we can about it. Once we've gathered this information, now we can go and try to replicate the issue. Try and figure out what steps do we need to go through to make this issue pop up. When we do this, we want to be able to replicate the issue with 100% certainty. Let's say the issue is that um, form submissions are broken. Um, of course, hopefully you'll have more information about what form it is, um, the error message you're seeing. But when you want to replicate the issue, you're trying to get that broken form um, behavior to occur. Now, if you can only get it to happen um, every other time, 50% of the time, how do you know later on when you fix it, or you think you fixed it, how do you know that you're not just hitting that 50% of the time when it works? 
uh, not the 50% of the time when it's broken. So it's really important to try and replicate the issue with 100% certainty. Now, there are some cases um, you might be dealing with um, you know, competing locks or race conditions in your database or these crazy one-off issues that you've never experienced before that are really hard to replicate with 100% certainty, and that's fine. But in almost every other case, you can replicate it with 100% certainty, so try to do that. Try and figure out what are the steps to make this issue happen. Um, if you like to do automated testing, go ahead and write an automated test that makes the issue occur. Because after you fix it, you can run that test again and see that it passes. And if not, you can just write out a bunch of manual steps. That's fine too. So once you have the information about the issue and you're able to replicate it with 100% uncertainty, now you can go ahead and try to identify the culprit. Go into the code and try and figure out what is the bug, where is it happening, why is it happening. When you do this, you want to be very methodical. Um, you want to kind of have a hypothesis in your mind, okay, I think it might be over here, let me look over here. Um, try not to make any assumptions um, without validating them first. So if you're um, dealing with a broken form, um, validate that the form data is being sent from the browser to the server. Validate that it's triggering the correct route. Validate that you know, it's passing validation. Don't just assume, oh, I submitted the form, it's definitely going to this controller. No, double check that, make sure that that is the case. And once you find that culprit, um, make sure you take time to understand the bug. Understand why it was behaving the way it was behaving. Why did you see that behavior on the website? Why did it cause that exception to be thrown? Really try to understand the fundamental nature of that issue because that's what's going to build your experience and your intuition. So once you've found that issue, now you can go ahead and fix it and retest. So once the issue is fixed, attempt to replicate the issue again. Hopefully the issue will not occur. And because you're 100% certain that those are the steps, run through the steps, no issue, awesome. You've solved the issue. Um, now when you try to implement that issue, be sure to avoid that XY problem. Try to avoid um, workarounds, um, whether or not they're permanent workarounds, temporary workarounds, um, workarounds are not ideal. Workarounds are going to add technical debt. Um, they might introduce other issues, like in my story. Um, they might not even get replaced with a true solution later. In my case, again, I work for an agency. Clients are paying me money to build their websites and to fix their issues. They don't want to pay me twice to fix an issue that I already fixed. Um, so if I want to fix it the right way, I need to fix it the right way the first time. They're not going to want me to go back later on and fix it again on their dime. So once we fix the issue and re we've retested, the final step is to mitigate future occurrences of this issue. Uh, if you're doing automated testing, add an automated test. Maybe you wrote this earlier when you were replicating the issue in step two. Maybe you don't do TDD and you like to um, create regression tests later on, that's fine too. Add a test to your test suite. The nice thing about tests is they take a few minutes to write and they're instant to run in the future. So you'll know immediately if that issue ever comes back. But mitigating future occurrences goes beyond just preventing it from happening again in your code base. It also means sharing your knowledge. Um, let's say that the issue you were dealing with is a common misconfiguration issue. Maybe something was poorly documented um, on the Drupal.org website or in your code base. Document it. Say, hey, watch out for this. Make sure you do that instead. If you learned something cool while you were debugging it, maybe you learned the internals of the form API, write a blog post on it. Share your knowledge with other people. If you asked a question on Stack Overflow and you didn't get an answer, but you figured it out anyway, go leave a comment on your post saying, never mind, I figured it out. Here's the solution. I can't tell you the number of times I've Googled a problem, found a Stack Overflow post, and the one answer is the person who submitted it, and they just said, never mind, figured it out. <laughs> OK, what did you figure out? What did you do? Like You've spent this time to debug the issue. You figured it out. Share that knowledge with others help them to avoid the issue or at least fix the issue quickly. And then if the issue happens to be um, in Drupal core or third party library or someone else's code, send a patch upstream. Say, hey, I encountered this issue. It happened when I did X, Y, Z. Here's the solution for it. Um, maybe you, know, you don't know the exact solution. Maybe it's a language you're unfamiliar with. Uh, maybe you weren't able to fix it, um, but you still kind of trace it back to that module or that package. Just leave an issue report on, with them. 
say, hey, I'm running into this issue every time I do X, Y, and Z, can you please help me? Anything you can do to help others mitigate future occurrences, um, that's gonna build you know, good karma. Um, if everyone, if every developer is doing this, that's gonna help you out as well. So do what you can to kind of give back and help others. So to recap this five-step process, um, first we were gathering information about the issue, um, get as much information as we can. Then we try to replicate the issue with 100% certainty. From there, we go into the code, identify the culprit, fix it, retest it, and do what we can to prevent future occurrences. And I think that adopting a five-step process like this has really good long-term results. I know it did for me. Um, for me, it helped me gain experience. Again, experience with the code that I'm working with, the frameworks I'm using, the packages I'm using, and the tools that I'm using to debug with. It also helps me to learn how the system works because I'm diving deep into this code and I'm being persistent and I'm debugging and trying to figure out what's going on. So the more time I spend debugging something like Symfony's um, HTTP kernel, the more familiar I'm going to become with that, the more expertise I'm going to develop. And this is also going to build um, our intuition. We're going to build this mental library of heuristics. So the next time we see that connection timed out error or a corrupt PDF, we know what we want to go check first. It's gonna help us um, debug much more effectively. And then lastly, I think having a five-step process like this is going to boost your confidence because this process can be used in any language, any framework, any CMS. The steps are the same. Even if the tools are a little different, the steps are the same. And if you're confident that you can go through this process, that'll help you um, to work on those unfamiliar systems and in those unfamiliar languages. So we talked about the five-step process. Um, what I'd like to do now is to kind of talk about some of the tools and techniques that I use during that process. Um, some of the tools that I use um, to debug the issues, some specific techniques for dealing with certain problems. Now, I am of the opinion that there are two essential tools that every developer should have, um, especially someone who's new to programming. I think they should have a good IDE and a good interactive debugger. Um, now, some of us more senior developers might say, I don't need an IDE, I'm perfectly happy with Vim or Sublime Text or Nano. And if that's you, then more power to you, that's awesome. Um, but newer developers, I think having an IDE will help them avoid simple issues um, like syntax errors. It'll help them navigate the code base quickly. Um, IDEs have a lot of really good features to help you debug problems efficiently and effectively and in some cases to avoid those problems from happening in the first place. A good IDE will also be integrated with an interactive debugger like Xdebug. If you've never used Xdebug before, I highly recommend you try it out. You can basically pause live code execution. You can tell PHP, hey, when you're, doing, when you're handling this request, stop on this line. I wanna see what's going on at this point in time. So you can stop on that line and then you can step through execution. You can say, okay, let's run the next line and see what happens. Let's run the line after that, see what happens. Let's go into that function and see what that function is doing. And as we're doing that, we can check out the different variables in that scope. We can see how our code is modifying those variables and how the state of our application is changing. And of course, we can explore the call stack. We can see how our code got to the current point in execution. Who called us? Who are we calling next? So an interactive debugger is extremely helpful for debugging issues. Now, in addition to these two tools, um, there are several techniques that can be very useful um, when debugging certain types of issues. So I'd like to go through each of these in a little detail here. The first technique is to trace backwards. If we're ever faced with a situation where we know where the error is being thrown, we might wanna trace backwards to figure out how we got to that point in time. Why is that piece of code running that's failing? Um, so we want to fire up our debugger, set a breakpoint somewhere, uh, run the code and see what's going on. 